Thank you for tuning in to the Practical Preservation Podcast. Please take a moment to visit our website, practicalpreservationservices.com, for additional information and tips to help you restore your historical home. If you've not done so, please subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, and also like us on Facebook. Welcome to the Practical Preservation Podcast, hosted by Danielle and Jonathan Kepperling. Kepperling Preservation Services is a family-owned business based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, dedicated to the preservation of our built architectural history for today's use as well as future generations. Our weekly podcast provides you with expert advice specific to the unique needs of renovating a historic home, educating by sharing our From the Trenches preservation knowledge and our guests' expertise, balancing modern needs while maintaining the historical significance, character, and beauty of your period home. Today on the Practical Preservation Podcast, I have uh, Mindy Crawford with me from um, Preservation Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about your background. Well, I'm I'm sort of an accidental historian and an accidental preservationist because this was, was, you know, I didn't I didn't grow up saying, oh, I wish I could work in history and preservation, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it I graduated with a degree in business management at, in 1982 when the economy was pretty bad. And I interestingly took a, a job typing national register nominations for Historic York, which is a countywide preservation organization. And you know, this was when you typed on a typewriter on archivally stable paper, <laughs> the national register nominations. And that's how I fell into preservation. And the more I learned, the more excited I got. So I um, went to Goucher College and got a master's degree in historic preservation. And then from there, I went to Preservation Pennsylvania. So from being a county and dealing with local preservation to uh, statewide. That's funny that you that you say that you were typing on a typewriter because I was in um, doing, uh, I was pulling a file for my consulting work and it was a, it was like, I was I, for a second I had to think about why it was because it was from the early 80s but it was typed on a typewriter and then it must have been like a carbon copy so it was on like the really thin paper <laughs> I was like oh I know why they did that <laughs> but I had to think about it <laughs> right I, I was very glad when the you know we got our first computer and we were allowed to actually type into and we were allowed to print out onto forms instead of actually typing because you couldn't use correction tape right either yeah. so yeah. it was a uh, I, I was very glad that I decided to take that typing class in high school. It re- served me well. <laughs> That's funny. I had, I was required to take, we were, everybody was required to take a typing class when I was in high school and I hated it. And I'm like, I'm never going to work in an office and now look at me. So <laughs> but that was, that was my, my thought all through high school. I'm never going to work in an office. I'm never going to need this. <laughs> so. well, when, when I went to your college, I went with my fancy bright orange electric typewriter and used to type people's term papers for them at a dollar a page. So the typing has turned out to be a really important oh, yeah. part of my career. <laughs> That's funny. So, so what drew you into preservation um, uh, as you were as you're working at Historic York? Well, it's the architecture. I, I mean, I remember my first day on the job, the executive director of Historic York asked me to go out and look at a building and tell her what kind of roof it had. Well, I had no idea. And right. so she said, well, I need to know if it's a hipped roof. And so she explained to me what a hipped roof was. And so I drove out and looked at the building and It was a hipped roof and I came back and told her and, you know, I spent the whole next week pointing out hipped roofs everywhere I went, which is the way everybody learns architecture. You learn the parts and then you put the parts together into the styles. And I was just fascinated by it. So one of the projects I worked on was to, you know, pull together a walking tour, uh, really immersed myself in architecture. And then from there, uh, Historic York was serving as the Harb consultant, the Historic Architectural Review Board consultant for the city of York. And that's when I started to realize that the architecture of York City looked the way it did because there was a review process. And I started to, you know, notice 
replacement windows or missing trim. And that sort of led me into, you know, we should be advocating for preservation. And so it was, it was a slow process. I mean, over the course of 20 years, I went from being the office manager to the program director to the executive director. And along the way, you know, I just, I did survey work. I wrote national register nominations. I, I did some construction management. I moved into tax credit consulting. And so for me, it was just a very slow process. And I actually got the master's degree when I was already doing most of that stuff. And it just gave me that legitimacy of having the, the degree uh, and confirmed, I mean, I learned a lot, obviously, but confirmed that um, I was in the right place and that I you know, was really passionate about it. So um, to tell me about um, Preservation Pennsylvania. So we're a, obviously statewide uh, nonprofit organization. We are not the State Historic Preservation Office. That's probably the biggest misconception right. because you know, it, it, it's a common thing to think we're the state when we arrive. And sometimes that isn't a bad thing because there's this <laughs> concern that maybe, you know, you're going to come in and tell me what I can and can't do. Right. The reality is we are not the State Historic Preservation Office. We were formed by the Pennsylvania legislature in 1982 as a revolving fund organization, which is how a lot of preservation organizations got started. You know, pot of money, you start to invest in preservation projects. The theory is that there are going to be loans, they're gonna come back in, and then that money is gonna keep revolving into the next project. Um, however, what we learned is projects that result in you know, delays or difficulty selling, you know, those revolving funds tend to revolve down to right. not a lot of money. And uh, so we actually merged uh, Preservation Pennsylvania at that time was called the Preservation Fund of Pennsylvania. We actually merged with another preservation organization to form Preservation Pennsylvania. So now we have um, really evolved into advocacy as our main priority. And, and I put that into two different categories. Legislative advocacy, making sure that legislation is favorable to preservation, making sure that programs and, and policies that are in place make it I don't want to say easier, but make it right. you know, more, more preservation friendly. Uh, and that means sometimes advocating for a piece of legislation or sometimes advocating against a piece of legislation, right. you know, something that would make it easier for municipalities to demolish buildings or, you know, so it could be any, any variety of things. So we need, need to keep an eye on what's going on at the state legislature as well as the federal, because mm -hmm. most funding for preservation that supports the state historic preservation office comes from federal allocation. Right. The tax credit program is a federal program. So changes to that are also concerning. Right. Um, and then the other part of advocacy is that grassroots advocacy, helping communities recognize the value of their historic properties, um, providing advice to put um, measures into place that there's a, so that there's a review process for the bu buildings that they think are most important. Um, a lot of times we are asked to come in there is that sort of idea that you come in as the statewide, it helps what the locals are saying to, right. to be legitimized a bit because you're coming in from outside and saying, oh, okay, pres you know, Preservation Pennsylvania agrees right. yeah. that this is what we should be doing. And that's what the Pennsylvania at risk list has been doing. Uh, we started that in 1992. Um, so we'll be celebrating 30 years of that next year in 2022. Uh, and that is an annual list of threatened historic properties. And we, by including it on the at risk list, you know, we have a couple criteria to do that. One, this is not, it, demolition cannot be a foregone conclusion. You know, the right. bulldozers are moved in, the permits are in place. The, us listing yeah. it on at risk is not yeah. going to make it, a difference. It, yeah, it's not, it's not at risk anymore. It's gone. <laughs> right. And that's hard for people to accept because right. there's this idea that you're going to jump in with all of this money and file an injunction and chain yourself to the bulldozer. And, and you know, yeah. in reality, no. <laughs> that right. doesn't um, so we are looking for things that, 
one, we think there's a possibility that there's going to be a change. There's a possible change in outcome. Two, there has to be grassroots support at the local level. Uh, you know, we can't do it ourselves. If there is a active local group, whether it's a citizens group or a local historical society or, or you know, any kind of preservation group, that makes all the difference in success because they're looking for assistance to help sort of raise the profile of the threatened resource and to, to just have a place to go for advice. Right. The other value is because we sort of have that you know, 30,000 foot view, we can see trends of, of things happening in other places in the state. We can right. connect people who've had successes in one area to help the folks in the other area. And um, the other thing that, that we try to do with at risk is if we do that, um, identify a theme, uh, one year we did metal truss bridges. One year we did schools, historic schools that were going to be demolished uh, for new schools. And you know we try to look for those trends in preservation that will ideally in a perfect world will change something about the process that will make it easier to save those resources in the future. And so that's been um, the bulk of our work because our, as I said, our revolving fund sort of revolved down. You know, right. There's a myth, I, I guess, um, I think I get an average of five calls or emails a week saying, I'm looking for a grant. Can you, oh, yeah. If you have yeah. one. No, <laughs> not, not, not really an option. <laughs> so um, we, we sort of see ourselves as keeping an eye on what's going on across the state, making connections, matchmaking, and it, it, it's, you know, there's just two of us. There's a staff of two. Right. And there are 67 counties. It's a very big state with a ton of historic resources. And so we really need to keep our eye on how we can sort of uh, influence the whole movement. Right. Not get super involved in any one individual project. Yeah. No, and that that makes sense to me. Just um, for when you're um, advocating for legislative change, is that also like at the municipality level or the municipal level um, um, or, we, or not as much? Is that more big, big, big picture? Most of our legislative work is either at the state level or the federal level. Okay. And for us, that might be us meeting with legislators and doing actual direct lobbying. Right. More often, legislators want to hear from the people in their districts. Right. So we'll prepare the, the background, what the ask is, and then we'll send it out as an advocacy alert, telling people to contact their legislators. And what I've learned now that I've been doing this for a long time is that the people don't, whether or not they watch Schoolhouse Rock and how a bill <laughs> becomes law, Right. Most people don't understand the process. So when a piece of legislation is in the, say, local government committee, there's no point in reaching out to people who are not on the local government committee. Right. So what we try to do is provide that interpretation. So we'll send it out and say, if your representative is on this committee, this is what you need to say to them, and this is what you need to ask. And then we sort of follow the bill as it moves from committee into the general you know, House or Senate. Right. And so we try to do very targeted outreach. Um, and it's successful. I mean, it's not always successful, but right. that is what it is become increasingly difficult for, for us as a statewide to reach out individually to each of the legislators, because some of them even, if you're not one of their constituents, they won't even accept an email from you. Right. So it's really important to empower people at the local level to reach out to their legislators. As far as local things like establishing a historic district or some kind of a demolition review, right. we generally refer people to the State Historic Preservation Office okay. for that because they have the sample language, they know what needs to be included in an ordinance. But what we will do if a, if a municipality contacts us and says, we are losing too many buildings, you know, we, that's where preservation happens at the local level. Right. And people need to speak up for what is important to them and they need to show up at meetings and let the supervisors or the commissioners or whatever the body um, governing body is know that right. they want these things protected because there's a, there's so many options there there's so many options for municipalities to protect their historic resources they can use the municipality's planning code to make everything from as simple as a demolition review to all the way up to reviewing you know a, a 
any changes. And then there's the enabling legislation that lets municipalities uh, establish historic architectural review boards. So that, that legislation, that municipality legislation ability is there. It's just a matter of starting at the bottom and, and working it up through the right. process. Yeah, yeah. I knew that there was sample language for municipalities. I wasn't sure if that was you, but that makes sense that the State Office of Historic Preservation does that. Right. And the one thing that is uh, is a challenge and something they're dealing with is it isn't really a one size fits all. So it's not right. like you can do a search and replace for replace one township right. for another. Yeah. Um, so they are they work their community preservation coordinators work with the municipalities to make sure that the language is appropriate for them. So um, and I don't know if we've kind of gone through this, but how does Preservation Pennsylvania engage with communities to encourage and support preservation? Well, we do try to provide a, a number of different educational, uh, either things on our website that you can download. We talk to, you know, we talk to, to groups all the time or if we're asked to come speak to a historic preservation commission or uh, a historical society or a preservation group, you know, we right. always talk about sort of how you save historic resources. Um, we, as I said, there's only two of us, so it's kind of hard to answer every single request for technical assistance, but we try to at least give, um, talk to each person or respond to each person to sort of either send them to a place where they can get more information or provide basic information and to enable them to find out for themselves, like how they can, how they can work. Um, it's difficult. I mean, <laughs> Pennsylvania's government makeup, you know, if we were in Maryland and everything was county based, you know, school districts were county based, right. it, you know, it would be a little bit, a little bit easier. But in Pennsylvania, there's, I don't know, it's some more than 2000 individual municipalities. Yeah, and yeah, it, there, I, think there's, operates, yeah I think there's over 60 in Lancaster County. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. And f there's 500 school districts, right? and, you know, so when you're talking about saving a historic school, you're basically talking about 500 individual school districts and 500 individual school boards. And, and it's just, you know, it's sort of difficult to work one by one through that. So we sort of try to raise that to a policy that makes sense across the state. That, that makes sense. So from your, your view of seeing, you know, trends and challenges across the state, what do you see as like the, the, the emerging trends and challenges in preservation? Um, well, funding is always an issue. I mean, <laughs> I, I, it, it sounds so ridiculous to say it's all about money. I mean, it's not really all about money, but it, it, it's the most common question, you know, where can I get funding to do this? And I'm not just talking about homeowners. I mean, we do get a lot of calls from homeowners looking for grants to yeah. redo their porch or whatever, but, yeah. but I mean, any kind of funding. So a community group wants to save a building, they have to raise money the way everybody does, it, right. because, yeah. you know, the grant funding is very limited. The, the Keystone Historic Preservation Grant funds are great, but they're only for municipalities and nonprofits. Right. And, you know, it's a 50-50 match. So, um, funding is, is a challenge. I personally think uh, after doing major projects and doing minor projects that, that uh, seed grants are, are really, mini grants and seed grants are really helpful because a lot of these small community groups are, you know, they're volunteer led. Often at this point, they're elderly people who are trying right. to save a church or a cemetery um, and a $500 mini grant to help them either hire someone to give them an assessment or to begin a documentation process makes a big difference. So right. I think that's something as we're looking to, to celebrate, you know, I said the Pennsylvania at risk is 30. Well, the organization is turning 40 in 2022. So it's a big anniversary year for right. us. You know, we're looking at trying to refund sort of a mini grant program so that we will be able to have I mean, they're not, we're never going to be able to provide a million dollars to rehabilitate a building, but we may be able to provide funding that will help someone sort of lift their project off the ground. Right. To at least get started and get some traction. Yeah. yeah. And to get some guidance. The other thing, and this, you know, this is, people are so angry these days about everything. And, you know, I, I just, I want to say that, that one of the things of all my background, other than taking typing, one of the most valuable things that I did was to be a debater in high school oh, yeah. and college, because it's really important to see 
both sides of an issue. I mean, a passionate developer who, who, who doesn't see the value of that historic building, but sees this new development. Right. They have a vision. They yeah. have a vision. And the, you know, the group that's opposing it also has a vision. That right. place has always been there. It's really important to the community. It could be rehabilitated. I mean, if you're going to be effective, you, you got to meet everybody where they are. And you can't scream at supervisors because they voted for something. You can't scream at developers. It's it's right. really about keeping your cool and, and trying to see both sides. And, you know, that, that's where debating helps because depending on which side, if you're affirmative or negative you you, you know you sort of got to understand both things and I think that every successful preservation project has been the result of compromise everyone gives a little and maybe no one is happy and I think that might be a success you know I often often feel like that way when um when they're talking about you know whatever whatever legislative they're agenda they're trying to push through. I, I feel like if both sides come away a little bit unhappy, it's probably the best. <laughs> I agree. Absolutely. And the thing about it is, is that at the, at that final celebration, like ribbon cutting or, or, you know, deed signing or whatever, no matter what side you were on, everybody's lined up for the photo. And that's right. what it's all about because everyone can feel good about the part that they took. And, right. you know, it may be that you, you know, you all are only smiling for the photo, but the, the fact that you're all there is, is really, I think the win. And, and I think that's one of the things that's, we need to celebrate the successes, no matter how small they are, because what we tend to see is, oh, this building was lost and, right. you know, this building is about to be demolished. And, and yes, we have to, we have to recognize that too, but we also should be celebrating the successes um, because those community preservation stories are everywhere. You know, yeah. little groups that single-handedly are saving buildings or, or creating really interesting educational programs to help people learn about their history. I mean, that's, that's all good stuff. That is, yeah. But the other challenge I think we have right now is getting our heads around telling the full story of sites. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, you know, at the time when most National Register nominations and National Historic Landmarks were designated, you know, we were telling the white story. We were telling the story of, you know, former presidents and, and, and white history. Right. And those other untold stories are there where we have to find them and, and incorporate them. And it doesn't take away from, from the original story, but there's just so many multifacets. It's like a building rehab. I mean, I know you know all about this is that you know, just because a change was made 50 years after the building was built doesn't mean it's not important, shouldn't be retained. Right. We have yeah. to, it's a layering and we have to be able to sort of see those different layers and the different evolution. I mean, look at how many buildings are, you know, important because of three different people that live there at three different times. And right. you know, we yeah. have to remember that it's the, the, whole, the whole story of the site right. that's important. Yeah. No, and I, I I agree. I agree with you. I actually often will tell people, you know, it's a debate within preservation. Do you take it back to the original or do you, uh, you know, you honor those changes throughout time? And, you know, that's not, you know, that's not um, if, if it's a private residence or, you know, not not necessarily a museum, you know, your your period of significance is not as important as if you're, you know, just trying to tell the story of one person. But um, I agree. I think that telling a more complete story of, of all of the, all of the places um, allows people to see themselves in, in the history too. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's really important. That's what people get excited about, yeah. you know, when yeah. they can make the connection. You know, I, I also think it, it's, it's encouraging to me. So the, so the pandemic ended, resulted in several of our at-risk buildings actually being saved. And Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly why that is. I mean, one thing is recessions are good for saving buildings because people don't have the money to do anything back to them. However, when the economy recovers, then everyone is, you know, suddenly excited about uh, moving forward with projects. But what I'm seeing, and I've had, I think four calls in the last two weeks from both preservation groups and homeowners who are looking to put either easements or protective covenants on their buildings before they sell them. And I think that that's something that sort of, you know, 
right. has cycles where people don't want that protection and people do want that protection. And right now I'm seeing a real interest in getting, putting easements and covenants on buildings. And so I think we're going to develop um, some guidance documents for that and maybe do a webinar that, that helps people understand what their, what their options are. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and I often will tell people, um, that that's an easement's the only thing that will protect your building. You know, nothing, nothing else will. And even that sometimes gets a little bit tricky, but that's that's the that's the only thing that will will guarantee, you know, that that it won't that it will that it'll remain. Yeah, that that's that's sort of a, a sad thing for um people thinking that the National Register is going to protect their building yeah. um, or National Historic Landmark designation is going right. to protect their building. Um, I, I, you know, th like I said earlier, the power is at the local level. If there's a local review district, if there is a required review of a demolition by the local municipality, that's more likely to result in a building being protected than, than anything. Right. I mean, the National Register is great, and it, it's a very, you know, it's an honor. It's a, it's, it's a, a big process. Prestigious, a, right. It's a huge process to get yeah. through and, and something to be proud of. But unfortunately, it's not going to not gonna change the outcome. You have to, you know, either protect it yourself with an easement or at least have it protected in a local district. Right. And the other challenge, I, I think, for preservation is historic preservation sort of falls in the, in the cracks of history funding. Mm, I mean, yeah. there, there, there's never enough funding, but preservation organizations don't qualify as museums. They don't qualify as historical societies. So a lot of times, in, in fact, a lot of the, the pandemic funding the, through like the CARES Act and, right. and things like that, you know, many, most preservation organizations couldn't qualify for that because they don't meet the criteria of being a historical society or a museum or a house museum because they don't really, they don't, often don't have places. They don't, right. they don't have real physical locations. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're sort of doing their work all across mm -hmm. the, the region. Um, and I'd like to see that change. I'd like to yeah. see, I think local preservation organizations, they have, they have, <laughs> they have plenty of work to do and right. it'd be really great if we could find some way to get those, those types of organizations additional support for operations and funding. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, is there anything that you thought about as we were talking that maybe I didn't think to ask you or that that kind of just popped into your head that you wanted to share before before we kind of finish? Well, I was I was mm -hmm. thinking about the whole idea of maintenance because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't talk about that as as to, you know, what really needs to happen is that people taking care of not just protecting their buildings with with local right. ordinances, but <laughs> you know, cleaning out your gutters and taking care of leaks and, you yeah. know, dealing with, you know, it, it's a big, it's a big responsibility to own a historic building, whether it it's a residence or whether it's your business. Um, and good maintenance goes a long way. I mean, if a building without a roof or a building with a leaky roof isn't going to last. So right. I, I don't think another thing you don't, I mean, that's one of the challenges of, of, of funding as well, because people don't give you money to maintain your building. You know, if you wait long enough and your building is in at the verge of collapse, you might be able to do a major preservation project to repair it. But if it had been maintained all along, right. that would not have been needed. And so right. I, I'd, I'd love to see some kind of, I don't know, maybe a um, something that's easy for people to follow, a cyclical maintenance um, sort of download that would help them to... Right understand what they need to look for before it becomes a big problem, because I think it would save a lot of, you know, these buildings that are on imminent collapse, which perhaps if it hadn't had a leaky roof for 20 years, would, right. <laughs> wouldn't have yeah, a problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's, <clears throat> that's something that we try to really encourage is maintaining properties and people say, well, you do smaller projects. I'm like, well, yeah, because maintenance is important. Like you, we, you can't just go in and do a huge project. It makes sense to make a maintenance schedule spread it out over, you know, a period of time where you, you're, you're constantly doing small projects so you don't have to do large projects. So I, I, I really do um, agree with that. And the, um, what was that? Oh, and then the, uh, we, I was, when you said about the leaky roof, we had a, we do a presentation where we talk about like how to plan your project. And it's like, make sure it's safe, make sure, you know, you don't, you have water, not getting water in the house. And then finally we get to like the finishes, you know? And I said, you know, that's why, you know, you, then you can do the fun stuff that everybody wants to do first. And I, I, we were, we did a, we were doing a presentation, the woman in the front row 
her her eyes just lit up and she said she said that's why our plaster keeps failing we need to fix the roof <laughs> well, so. you know that actually brings up something that we didn't talk about but this whole issue of historic trades i mean right. it's so hard to find people who know what they're doing and um we we had some roofing work done uh, on our carriage house, but we also had one missing slate on um, the turret right. of our roof. And when the guy came, he was working all over the roof. And I was, I was a little startled by that. So finally I went out and I said, I'm not, sh I'm not sure what you're doing. And he said, well, you know, I'm the slate guy, you have me for the day. So I went ahead and just, I replaced like six, six slates that looked kind of off to me. Yeah. And I was like, that's amazing. That's like, great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, our, our roof, our personal house um, has Delta blue slate, which is, you know, it's been here since 1903 yes. when the building was built and, you know, he was able to make, you know, replace six slates and we're good to go. Yes, and, yeah. You know, that is so valuable. So you know, we, we're, finding a good contractor is difficult and everyone is too busy and you know I'm sure you understand that um so I I do think we should all be supporting historic trades we should yeah. be encouraging people to consider the trades uh, the historic trades as an option for yeah. a career um there's um Preservation Maryland is working on that I I know I think you already talked to them about that yeah, but I did. think it's something yeah. we all have to embrace because finding a good plaster is hard Yes. Yeah. Finding a good carpenter is practically impossible. <laughs> um, so we need to yeah. all be working together to sort of raise that as, I mean, that anyone who wants to start, you know, gets the training to start a business to do carpentry could probably be booked out for the next three years. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and we hear that a lot, you know, of like Jonathan just worked for a couple that we had, um, we had worked for many years ago and, they, they said, they said, you come when you say you're going to. And Jonathan's like, well, it's the schedule. <laughs> but like, I, I know, I know from dealing with some contractors that that is not always the case. <laughs> um, yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. Uh, we had a few issues of that ourselves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I really do. And I think that, um, I think that encouraging trades and, and encouraging, people to, to do this, this work is, is very important. And it's also continuing the skills, making sure that those skills are retained and, and remembered. Um, because the way that the way that houses are built now and the materials that we use are completely different than, than what would be used traditionally. Yeah, I, I do. I do serve as a, um, the Harb consultant for a small borough. And I just, just recently did, I, I won't say where, I just <laughs> recently <laughs> did a review and, you know, these lovely federal style building with these six over six windows and and you know the proposal was to replace them with right. the cheapest final windows you can imagine like uh, from Home Depot or something yeah. and you know I, I you know the, they didn't they didn't approve them they, they right, did right. ask him to take take the time to have them assessed individually but you know we're losing so much material because are, yeah. it's the easy route and if you can't get a good contractor to come work on it yeah. you're stuck with hiring, you know, Somebody the vinyl window guy right. who knocks on the door and it's, you know, it, it I, I understand why it happens. Yeah. Yeah. I do too. And, and I, I hear often from people, I didn't know somebody did this work. So I try to encourage people to like, there are resources, there are, you know, there's directories. I know you have a directory on your website of, of contractors. Like there are there are there are options of if people are willing to look a little bit further there are people that are that can do this work right and i will um we are working with preservation maryland on their preserve list mm -hmm. which is i think you know the hope is to make that a regional location where you right. can find contractors who specialize in preservation um and as i said it's it's so needed um that that's we wish we had a big you know toolbox full of contractors right. that we could send you their contact information. But, you know, most of the people that I run into, um, you know, I say, hey, 
because I'm always asking for my own personal right. reason because of having a big house, you know, and that he's, you know, most people who say, yeah, well, I, I, I have more work than I can do before I die. So oh, no, I'm not interested yeah. in any more clients. <laughs> um, so I think it's a real need that we're going to have to fill because it's, we can, we can convince people to preserve properties, but if we can't get people to work on them, it's, right. we're, we still haven't, we still haven't yeah. made the success we need. No, I, 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 I really, I, I do agree with that. Um, so how can, how can our listeners support uh, your mission? Well, I think uh, I, I will refer again to the fact that we are not the State Historic Preservation Office, which means our funding does not come from federal, state, right. or local funding. And so we do rely on you know, philanthropy, membership, donations, work, uh, you know, from individuals, foundations, companies. And so supporting us through um, financially is, is great. And you can do that through our website. Uh, but the other support that's needed is advocate in your own community for preservation. Attend those township meetings, attend those planning commission meetings and, and really be clear about how important historic buildings are to the places that we live, work and play. And uh, because that helps us, I mean, we can support that, but we can't do it ourselves. And so supporting historic preservation by everybody having the same message is, is really helpful. Yeah. So, and how can our, how can our listeners contact you? So the easiest way is to uh, go to our website, preservationpa.org. All of our contact information is there, along with a lot of uh, resource guides that can be downloaded. Um, we have one on windows and uh, one on how to make decisions about whether or not a property can be preserved or not. And then we're, of course, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, on our website, you can sign up for our monthly e-newsletter, which is a combination of uh, updates on our work, but also other things that are going on that other organizations are doing. We've just started a monthly webinar series. We had, um, we, we're hoping to continue that through the fall and into next year. Um, at this point, we're taking a, a bit of a break on our statewide conference um, and to sort of reevaluate that. And it's, 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 not a, it's not a great time to be planning large scale conferences anyway, because everything's so uncertain. Right. Um, so we're finding the webinars, you're, you know, the, the one we, the most recent one we did was sold out. So, you know, oh, we're feeling great. that there's, there's, you know, definite interest and we're trying to do a variety of topics uh, because the more people we can encourage to speak up for historic resources. I mean, that, that sort of, I drove by and it looked like something scary was happening. Can you find out what that is? You know, that, <laughs> that's, <laughs> let me get my magic flying bus. And I, <laughs> and I, will. I, I had a, I had a call yesterday and it was, I want you to save this house. And I said, well, what's the address? And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, well, I <laughs> you know, what, one of the areas that, you know, I just have a personal interest in is roadside architecture. So, you know, drive in movie theaters, right. diners, restaurants, motels. And those are the ones that disappear overnight because yeah. the value of those are, are definitely still pretty underrated. And right. You know, it's that thing you walk, you drove by it literally every day. And one day you looked over and it isn't there anymore. And it's startling, but right. you yeah, know, yeah. this, you know, I always say to people when I, when I do presentations, you know, if you see something you like, take a photo of it because the next day it might be a Royal That's farm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, yeah. it, 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 it's very precious and, you know, there's lots of great preservation work going on there. You know, we've had so many great success stories. We're going to do a new, um, 10 years ago, we did a, an evaluation of all of our at-risk properties and uh, we were pretty happy with our numbers. I mean, we had actually only lost 25% over the whole, you know, whole first 20 years. So we're hoping to find something pretty similar when we look at it for our 30 year review. And so there are great success stories, but we're also losing things every single day. Right. Yeah, I um, when you said about the roadside uh, motels, every time we see one that's like super fun and like mid-century modern, I'll tell Jonathan we should buy one and like run it. I could be the front desk lady, and he's like, "No, that's not fun." Right. <laughs> well, I have a secret thing too. You know, the Lincoln Highway Motor Court. You know, oh yeah. Outside of Bedford is for sale, and <laughs> you know, I I said said to my husband, "Should we move?" to Bedford and run the Lincoln Highway Motor Court. And he said, 
I know. <laughs> Just in my dreams. Yes, yes, yes. So I, you know, I want to save them all. I, I, I you know, I, I, I want them all to be there. And, uh, you know, everybody has to, everybody has to buy one. So we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan's like, I attract enough, enough strange people. I, I, I can't imagine the people we would meet running a motel. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, the Lincoln Highway enthusiasts, is, you know, they always talk about the Lincoln, the Lincoln Motor Court as yeah. being, you know, stepping back in time. But, you know, they're the folks that own it now are getting ready to retire and they've run it for many years and they've done a wonderful job with it. And, you know, we need that that next passionate person to come in because, you know, if you're if you're traveling Lincoln Highway from New York to San Francisco, it's a must see, must stop. And, right. you know, we don't want to lose it. Well, thank you so much. I really, I really enjoyed our conversation today. Thanks for having me. It was covered a lot of topics very yes. quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Practical Preservation Podcast. The resources discussed during this episode are on our website at practicalpreservationservices.com forward slash podcast. If you received value from this episode and know someone else that will get value from it as well, please share it with them. Join us next week for another episode of the Practical Preservation Podcast. For more information on restoring your historic home, visit practicalpreservationservices.com.